quite a number already have joined. So I uh, already acknowledge their, their presence as well as once again, appreciate the participation of all the rest. Feel welcome and uh, prepare yourself for an exciting two hours uh, coming up because it's uh, not only a, a great topic that we're going to exchange on, but also we have such a great speaker as always, the norm in SALT Institute. So for now, I'd like to um, start with a word of prayer. And we have one of our students, Tyron, who is going to be uh, the one leading us with a word of prayer. So I'm looking through the list and I see Tyron is yet to join. So in that connection, allow me to invite uh, Pastor Harbert, who um, is always on standby to uh, usher us in, uh, in a word of prayer. Please, Pastor Harbert, would you kindly um, usher us with a word of prayer? Um, let us pray. Father, we are so, so grateful. We thank you for yet another privilege that, Lord, you have given to us. Uh, we thank you for uh, this guest seminar. And we thank you, Lord our God, for the topic that is going to be uh, discussed. We ask that your presence will take over the entire seminar from start to finish. We ask for the heavens to be opened in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask that, Lord, you will grant uh, the guest speaker, Lord, the utterance and the capacity, Lord our God, to do justice to the subject matter for which uh, this uh, seminar has been called. And above all, we ask that, Lord, we shall have a smooth uh, sail from the beginning of the seminar even to the end. May your holy name alone be praised. May your holy name alone be glorified. To you be all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Herbert. Uh, for the introductory prayers. And I already see that our guest uh, speaker is, is on. Uh, and um, indeed, for those who are joining us, uh, and um, maybe by way of introduction, I am Catherine, and uh, I am, I'm going to be the moderator for today. I am a student in the SALT Institute. And uh, for tonight, uh, this evening, uh, we are going to have quite an exciting um, session uh, looking into the quest for transformational leader, leadership and uh, managing the conflict between integrity and money. Such an exciting uh, topic. And we have um, a very renowned guest, uh, a very renowned speaker who's going to be our guest speaker for, for uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, Dr. Mr. Manasse Azure, who most of you uh, know uh, because he's um, somebody that I will not even introduce further because we have a special introduction that we will do by one of the, of the students. Uh, but um, so for this, um, you know, 22nd day of February 2022, I invite you all, for those who are joining us now, for the second guest seminar series that is uh, normally held by the SALT Institute. We normally have biannual, bi-weekly um, guest series where we come together, reason together, exchange together, and not only get information from our uh, speakers, but also exchange because there's a wealth of uh, experience also around the screen, and uh, we, we always exchange uh, for the benefit of our, um, for the benefit of our, our continent. Really looking together on transformational ways that uh, our continent can be and should be better. So tonight is one of those uh, uh, evenings that uh, we will uh, listen uh, through uh, to an interesting topic as well as an interesting uh, speaker. So with that, I would like, and I was uh, also giving a few more minutes so that more people can join us. Um, and I would now like to pass uh, over to one of our students, uh, Grace, to officially introduce our guest speaker for, for this evening. Grace, please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine for the opportunity. A very good evening to you all. So this evening I have the singular honor of introducing our guest speaker, 
for today's guest seminar series. Our speaker for today is an award-winning Ghanaian Pan-African investigative journalist. He is a patriotic and anti-corruption crusader who has served as a resource person for the West African journalist trainings on tracking contracts and stopping corruption, among other media trainings in Ghana and across Africa. After graduating from the School of Journalism, he practiced briefly as a freelance journalist before joining Joy 99.7 FM. the senior broadcast journalist in He resigned in 2019 as freelance journalism. He's also a recipient of many awards in recognition of his outstanding performance in journalism, including the overall best journalist in West Africa and the Integrity Personality Award of the Year 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's welcome our guest speaker for today, Mr. Manasse Azuri Awuni. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, uh, staff, faculty, students of the Salt Institute. I thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you. And this, I must say, is a very important topic because if you are in this country or if you are on our continent, you should be worried about the fact that uh, it appears we are so far behind. And one cannot but say that one of the reasons Africa is where it is, is because of the lack of integrity in leadership. We have the brains and uh, those of us who have gone out a bit would realize that if you look at our resources and what we have, it doesn't tell a good story when you look around. So integrity in my view is very important and it is much so when we talk about leadership. I would want to share my screen and then uh, we do a bit of a uh, I don't know if it can be seen now. Yes, indeed, we can see your screen, but it's still oh. not on presentation mode. Okay, let me see. Is it now? Excellent, yes. Oh. Thank you. So uh, the discussion, which I consider it a discussion because we are here to share ideas. And then uh, what we are to think about or the quest topic I was given says the quest for transformational leadership, managing the conflict between integrity and money. That is such a huge conflict. And I would want to focus on uh, two major things, the relationship between leadership and integrity and then money, and also the conflict that often arises uh, between uh, money and influence, or if you call it leadership. So the question that often comes to mind when this topic is mentioned is, so what is leadership or who is a leader? This is a very important question to a very simple issue. A certain uh, character in, I think, Chinua Achebe's Antilles of the Savannah mentioned that I don't uh, understand English, but if I hear Kacham, I don't need anybody to tell me what that means. 
So we all here know what leadership is. We all have an idea of who a leader is. But there are some people who have specialized in a topic and uh, they have certain views about leadership, what it is and what it is not. In research, I came across a number of uh, them, but one that enthused me was uh, a leadership author, Kevin Cruci, and he talks about what leadership is not. And he says, leadership has nothing to do with seniority or one's position in the hierarchy of a company. So you can even make it a school, a university. It can be your home. It can be your business. It can be anywhere. And what he is saying is that leadership has nothing to do with seniority or uh, one's position in the hier hierarchy of a company. And that is a bit troubling, confusing because for a lot of us, myself included, we often equate leadership to those at the very top. But this man says, it has nothing to do with this. He again says leadership has nothing to do with titles. And you may see a photograph of uh, one of the most, I can say the most decorated footballer of all time. Uh, those who have supported uh, Barcelona for quite a long time would uh, tell you how this man has brought joy to them. And those of us who have hated Barcelona for a long time would also tell you how much pain he has caused us anytime we watched him in his prime against our favorite uh, football clubs, Lionel Messi, seven Ballon d'Ors, and quite a number of awards, titles, and uh, records. But Kevin Cruz tells us that leadership has nothing to do with titles. We move on to another thing he says, or three of the things he says leadership is not. And he says it has nothing to do with personal attributes. Uh, there are people, so this person is charismatic, this person looks nice, this person is uh, attractive, this person speaks well. Does it mean that once you speak well, that you're a leader, once you look very good, you must lead, or once you're charismatic, that automatically makes you a leader. He says leadership has nothing to do with personal attributes. And there's one that I also want to add that leadership is not about being great or occupying a great office. I thought about this, or this has become so evident to me because of the man you see um, in this slide, the former president of uh, the United States of America. America, in no doubt, is uh, the greatest country in the world. Some may dispute it, but that is what is generally accepted. And I believe in that too. And occupying the flag, sorry, the, the, the White House or being the president of the United States is like being the greatest office holder in the entire world. Uh, when the president of the United States speaks, sometimes you get the United Nations secretary having to reconsider their stance and positions on certain things. But the mere fact that you have an occupant of this uh, great office doesn't really mean you have a leader in that office. And Donald Trump, for some of us, exemplified the fact or the notion or the opinion that leadership is not about just being great or occupying a great office. What then is leadership? And Kevin Cruz says, leadership is a process of social influence which maximizes efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal. To be a leader, it is a process of social influence. A process because you don't just get up one day and become a leader. 
it goes through a process. If you look at a traditional African system, our chieftaincy institutions, in places that uh, the institution is very well respected or even valued, these days there has been a number of, uh, or well, there have been a number of reasons that the institution has been adulterated. But we are told that in the past, if you are born into a royal family, you are specifically trained in a certain way so that when your time comes to ascend the throne, wouldn't have a lot of bruises to your character or integrity. So leadership is a, a, a process. It is also about social influence. And that social influence is meant to maximize the efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal. So a great leader is not necessarily the person who can do it most. You know, Messi can be a very great footballer, but that doesn't mean he would end up being a very good coach or even a good uh, captain. I have watched uh, Messi and I've also watched uh, Ronaldo and I must confess, I like both, but I am a favorite uh, or a fan of Ronaldo more than Messi. And sometimes when you watch these people or these two great footballers play, you will realize that there are times, I think there was just uh, a match, I can't quite remember what, uh, which team, uh, Ronaldo and his people were, were playing against. I think that was a match that he broke the record as the highest scorer for international uh, for of any uh, player for their national uh, team. And he scored two goals. And these goals came very late. And they were a goal down. And when the whistle was almost over, you saw... Ronaldo going around the field and encouraging his uh, fellow players of Portugal. And it was such an amazing night when at the very end, he netted two goals and his people won. Sometimes you watch Messi and when his team is losing, uh, you hardly see him inspiring anybody, even though he's about the greatest on the pitch, wherever you found him. So all that I'm trying to say, or what Kevin uh, Cruz wants us to know is that to be a great leader, the social the influence you have based on what you yourself are made of is meant to maximize the efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal. So sometimes it is not about you doing it, it is about you getting people to do it towards a certain direction to achieve a certain end. Uh, for the traditional system, it is often said that it is the wisdom of others that prevents the king from being called an idiot. So you may find certain chiefs always speaking wisdom, always acting in ways that brings honor and dignity to the throne, but sometimes they themselves may not necessarily be that wise knowledgeable or well-behaved, they maximize the efforts of others to get to what they want to do. Now, the question is what qualifies one for leadership? We often know that, well, almost always, the people we find in leadership are people who we consider to be great. You can talk of the presidents, you can talk of ministers, you can talk of other diplomats, you can talk of business leaders, you can talk of vice chancellors, you can talk of clergy people. These are great people that we often look out for. But Martin Luther King tells us that everybody can be great because nobody, because anybody can serve. You don't need to have a college degree to serve. You don't need to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of, full of grace, a soul generated by love. So if, even if we say that leadership is about people who are great or about people occupying great positions, which is almost always the situation, but the reality is that all of us can still lead. Even if we want to look at this, then everybody can also be great. And that greatness does not necessarily mean occupying a very huge public office. 
I was in the United States in 2014, and I had a privilege of visiting five different states in the US, starting from Washington, DC. And I did not conduct any scientific survey, but just casually observant and looking around the states I visited, I realized that there were more monuments of Martin Luther King Jr. than most presidents of the United States. And I dare say that he's more popular than many of the presidents of the United States. There are a few presidents in the past that we still remember, Lyndon Johnson and uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, and a few ones such as uh, Abraham Lincoln and the recent ones, Obama and Bush and the others. But if you want to place Martin Luther King, his place in world history, he stands tall above a lot of the presidents of the United States. But this is somebody who was not even a, a congressman or an MP. So at the time, he was considered the moral leader of the nation. And so if this man is telling us that leadership or greatness is at the reach of everyone, then we have no reason to believe it. Sorry, to doubt him. You go anywhere, Martin Luther King Boulevard, you go to Congress, his statue is there, Martin Luther King Memorial, and you wonder what became of many of the other presidents we hardly hear of, or we don't even remember. The question is who can be a leader? In my view, anybody can lead. Leadership is service. And if you can serve, then it means you can lead. lead. It doesn't really matter your age. It doesn't really matter your position. It doesn't really matter your profession. We have this 15 year old a Pakistani girl who received a Nobel prize because of certain boldness and bravery she exhibited. When people were so scared of the Taliban, this young woman stood up and was counted and the world recognized him. In countries of that nature, you hardly find women willing to even uh, talk or challenge authority. And when the brutal regime of the Taliban set in, you hardly even, uh, 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 how do you call it, expected people of this nature uh, to bring up their voices or raise their voices. And uh, it is like that. Uh, in, Iraq, Afghanistan, and a lot of those places. I also, I come from the northern part of Ghana and growing up, I knew that if you're a woman, your voice wasn't heard, even in the affairs of things. So in some of these Arab states where you have a very radical movements, it was very difficult for such a person to stand up, but she made her voice known, her impact felt, and the world stood up to celebrate her. So I believe that everybody can be a leader. Everybody can influence others. And when we talk of leadership, let's not only think about the national level. There's leadership at every level. The best form of leadership is what you exhibit at home. You can be a student, you can be a teacher, you can be a nurse, a doctor, a politician, it can be a security at the entrance, but you can exhibit certain qualities of leadership that others will be influenced positively and be held to attain or achieve their organizational goals. I have worked in places before and I have come to realize that there were certain security men at the entrance or car park that I respected more than some of the managers. So it doesn't really matter your position. When we talk about transformational leadership, I say that uh, good or trans transformational leadership often begins and ends with integrity. You can't say somebody is a good leader, somebody is transformational, 
in their leadership and say, well, the only thing they lack is integrity. If you lose it, then you would find it extremely difficult to be placed side by side with leadership, let alone transformational leadership. And in this country, we have an organization that we grew up with to know that the motto of that organization was service and a uh, service with integrity. And when we grew up to a certain level and started encountering the Ghana police service, then the motto service with integrity for me became like an oxymoron or those uh, literary devices that try to place contrasting uh, terms side by side. Then also in our lifetime or in my lifetime, I got to realize that, well, there can be transformational leadership even in some of the places you least expect leadership in its purest form or its impactful form to emerge. And that's what I call the Dampari effect, the Dampari effect and why it is working. The Dampari effect is working in my view because of integrity. I have a number of police officers who are my friends. And even before he became the IGP, sometimes you talk about why there was so much despondency and uh, misbehavior. They tell you it's from the top. Um, I decided there are a lot of uh, academic, intellectual, and other motivational quotes about integrity. But one that I find interesting and uh, want to use is what the dictionary says. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. The state of being whole and undivided. Talking about the damper example, uh, some of us were told that to be able to get to the position of the IGP, some may have to compromise in a number of ways. Some have to lick boots, make promises. And so once you get there, you owe allegiance to others. Some also on their way to the top got themselves so soiled that they get there and they have no integrity or moral right to tell somebody to do what is right or to do what is wrong. But in all of these, they kept mentioning the name of this man, Dan Paris, saying that, well, this man has a lot of integrity, but we doubt that he will ever become the IGP because of who he is. Fortunately, he appears to be one of the best uh, appointments ever made by our current president. And when Dan Paris became president, sorry, IGP, he, some of us in the media followed you won't find him making bold statements here and there. You won't find him doing this action man kind of show. You won't find him talking tough, warning people or threatening ABC. But that impact has been felt. And for me, the greatest testimonies of this transformational leadership that the Ghana Police Service is currently enjoying has to do with the recent suspension of the Metropolitan Chief Executive for Sekandi Takrade, who was stopped by some police and then he misbehaved. The police man stood his ground and ensured that he was arrested. I have lived in this country for quite some time now, and I know this would never have happened but for the kind of leadership we have at the top of the Ghana Police Service. The Metropolitan Chief Executive is the chairman of the Security Council of Sekendi Takrade. So if you have a policeman in Sekendi Takrade, you report the commander of the Metropolis reports to this man. So to find quote in quote, an ordinary police officer standing up to a bully of a politician 
whose party is in power and saying that what you have done is wrong, I'll hold you accountable, I'll show that you are arrested and still ensure that that meant that there was something that uh, was beyond him. And there is a proverb that says that if you find a bird dancing in the middle of the road, don't assume that the bird is mad for its dramas are probably in the nearby bush. And so the, 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 the dramas for these police officers across the country are now being bold enough to challenge the politician and ensure that the right thing is done. For me, it has to do with the leadership at the very top. And that couldn't happen if this man up there didn't have integrity. The question is, why does integrity even matter in leadership? It ensures consistency. If you are a leader and you have integrity, then your decisions are likely to be consistent. Your followers are likely to be consistent. It ensures predictability. There are some people in leadership position who signal left with their traffic indicators and turn right. And when that happens, it causes accident because those following know that you are turning left. So they may want to drive in a certain way. They may want to overtake in a different lane. So when you signal to the left and turn right, you're likely to cause crisis because your pred predictability can never be uh, assured. Integrity builds credibility. And if you're a leader without credibility, then you have no business being called a leader. You may just be occupying a position that is higher than that uh, or those of others, but that is not leadership. Leadership, sorry, integrity helps to build trust and trust in home, trust in school, trust in the country, trust in the church, trust in every institution serves as that uh, bond which holds the institution together. So leadership, sorry, integrity really matters in leadership. When we talk about leadership, money and integrity, they are connected in a certain way. Most people in leadership position control or make decisions on the wealth of their followers. You can take politics. The leaders or so-called leaders, they make the decisions on how our money is spent. They make the decision on how the money is generated. So they control the money-making decisions. In religion, I don't know for other churches, but I know that I'm a Presbyterian. And in my church, we have the district minister, we have the local ministers, and even at the local level, we have the congregational session, which takes decision, uh, the budgets, and others. In institutions such as the Salt Institute, I do not believe that the decision on what to spend your money on and how to spend it will be taken by the students or the cleaners or the security men. Those are the top. Those in leadership position almost always take the biggest and most important decisions on how money or our wealth is distributed. The quality of leadership sometimes depends on how they use the money. So if you are, let's say an IGP and there is money and you think that instead of buying buses and conveying policemen, giving them de decent transportation to and from work, instead of doing that, you may want to well, use that money to enrich yourself, then you would end up exhibiting poor leadership and that poor leadership has to do with how you use the money. The quality of those decisions on money depends on their level of integrity. So if you're a leader, the quality of the decisions you take on money depends on your level of integrity. There are times I write articles about corruption and other things and then you find that people saying, well, 
are you telling us that human as you are more intelligent than the ministers and the politicians and even the president? I will never boast in a way that I'm more intelligent than them. Some know exactly what is right. They're more experienced. They're more exposed. They are more educated. They are more enlightened than I am. But if you have a corrupt person in a public position or a leadership position, they may end up taking very stupid decisions, not because they are stupid, but because of the lack of integrity. So the quality of the decisions leaders or so-called leaders make with money depends on the level of integrity. Now let's move towards the conflict between integrity and then money. There is often a conflict of interest of a sort. Integrity has its own demands. And the love of money also has its own pleasures that it can also achieve. Or money has its own pleasures. It helps to make life very easy for us. So humans are generally, or we generally have insatiable appetite for money. I don't think there's any of us here who would say, well, I want my salary to be decreased because I think I have enough. Or somebody who may earn a million cities and say, well, a million cities is done for the rest of my life. I wouldn't want to earn anything in addition. Generally, we have insatiable appetite. They are often exceptional cases, but generally humans have insatiable appetite for money. And that creates some kind of conflict when it comes to maintaining integrity and then money. We also have demands from family and friends and strangers. Uh, if you occupy a certain position, the, you are expected to have money and societal expectations too. I thankfully, or by the grace of God, rose very early in my journalism career. I completed my journalism school, my first degree in 2010, June, and the following uh, awards at the Ghana Journalist Association. I won six prizes. Sorry, I won three, including the most promising journalist of the year. And then the following year, I won. Um, four, making seven in less than two years since I completed and the following year, the overall best journalist in Ghana. At the time, all that I had was a small motorbike, which I got with the help of my brother. I wasn't actually working and being paid. I was doing freelance reporting in Ghana. Freelance is understood to be working for free, even though that's not what it's supposed to be. I became the journalist of the year and I had a small motorbike and I met some senior journalists who were not so enthused that I was riding a small motorbike. And what they said was, look, being a journalist of the year is just like uh, uh, being uh, the face of journalists for at least now. If they call for a meeting and you come on this motorbike, it doesn't befit the kind of honor that has been bestowed on you. But the other reality is that, or was that I wasn't any enough to, to be able to even buy a good motorbike, let alone a car. So how were they expecting me to fund that kind of lifestyle? Then in uh, 2013, I joined Joy FM in November, 2012. Two months later, January, 2013, I got some tip off about some corruption at the Ghana Youth Employment and Entrepreneurial Development Agency. A lot of officials were involved and I hadn't even got to the top. But one of the first JIDA officials I met was offering me a car. And his uh, point was that, oh, I'm not doing this because you're investigating as, you see, you are such an asset to the state and this motorbike you are on isn't safe you need to be protected. I told him, thank you. But 
I am happy on my motorbike. The June 3rd disaster happened and I posted a picture of I was living in Banana Inn, Abolo Junction or Abolo Bridge. My room got so flooded and people saw the picture said, well, if we hear of the name Manas, then we expect, we expect you to be living somewhere like East Legon or a better place. These are pressures and expectations of society. The truth of the matter at the time was that I was barely earning enough to take care of my needs, the needs of my family, and also to even rent a decent place. So the pressures are so real that to be able to fight and maintain integrity means you have to turn your back to money, which is sometimes not always easy. Because at the time, or even now, if I had decided to leave some of the stories I was doing, put them aside, I could have had houses even in Trasaco because people were making hundreds of millions of cities for no work done. And those contracts, a lot of them were canceled as a result of the work I did. So if somebody even used 5 million cities to buy a house for you and is making one of the contracts, the person was making 120 million cities every year. This was like free money that this person wasn't entitled to. So if that person is making 120 million cities and they can use just 5 million cities to bribe a journalist to stop being on their back, I'm sure they could do it or they would do it with a lot of uh, joy. In my book, The Fourth Estate, I recounted what happened between myself and the friend of the president two weeks before I published the president's fourth story. This friend told me that if I published that report, the NDC in 2016 wasn't going to survive the election. He did everything. And when I stood my ground, he said that, well, if this was about any other journalist, he wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't find it difficult. How much would they demand that we cannot pay? But we know you, Manasseh, there's no amount of money that will make you drop this story. So if possible, hold on to the story. Let's go for the elections. Then you, re you release the story. You will have told your story, but the impact will not be the same. And that too failed. So the pressures are often very real. If you want to keep your integrity, you would realize that there are a lot of other pressures in the form of money. Sometimes our past in dealing with this conflict or that the conflict also arises uh, from a past that we may dread. I grew up as a number two of 11 children. My father was a night watchman till I think 2018 thereabout when he went on retirement. So when I became an ass journalist of the year, everything, my father was still working as a night watchman and we had to struggle. Growing up, I couldn't go to the senior high school I wanted to go because there was no money. I struggled through my journalism school. My family didn't have uh, electricity till I was in my, close to the final year of my journalism uh, training. And we went through quite a lot. For those of you who do not know, I chose the name Manasseh myself because of my poor background. In primary six, I said I needed a Christian name. And in going through, I wanted to pick Daniel, David, and those kinds of uh, popular names, but I just saw a book, Christian names and their meanings. So I needed a name with a very good meaning. So I saw the name Manasseh, and the translation was loosely as uh, God has made me forget the suffering in my father's house. And I related that moment in Kitekrati where life was still difficult to my life back in Bongo in the Upper East region, when the next meal was a miracle. So I felt that, well, things had gotten better. My Koshioko had been healed. And so in primary six, I chose the name God has made me forget the suffering in my father's house, Manasseh, the translation I saw in that book to reflect my situation. So if I get into a situation or a job and uh, monies, houses, cars, and everything is being thrown at me, 
there is the temptation that you look at your past, which you dread so much, which you don't want any of your children or people you love to go through, you are likely to be swayed into compromising on your integrity and making money to give a better future to others. But that, in my view, isn't worth it. So how do we manage this conflict? The conflict is real. The first the day I entered uh, my room, the June 3rd disaster, 2015, and my room was so flooded, my books and documents flooded, and everywhere, you didn't know where the water was even coming from, whether it was uh, from the open gutters and others, and you know how dirty our gutters were, or still are, it was really, really tough. But one must manage this conflict and one must win. One of the ways I think we can manage this conflict is to be content with what we have. Contentment in my view isn't uh, the same as not being ambitious. If all you have today is thousand Ghana cities at the end of them every month, you will be happy to be earning 10,000 cities. But until you land a job or an opportunity that will give you 10,000 cities a month, tell yourself that I am satisfied with what I have for now, whilst you look for the greater uh, wealth or earnings. Contentment is very key. Without contentment, you can never, ever defend your integrity. Avoid competition. I often say that well, life is full of competition, but it isn't a race. And even if life is taken as a race, we all have different starting points and we have different finishing lines. There are people who are of your age who are doing so well, who are so far ahead of you. Don't look at them and then think that you are a failure because at age 30, age 40, your colleagues are building, your colleagues are doing all manner of things and you are still struggling to even rent. They can't say that's here, oh, to see so I won't tell you 10 I mean, if you are born on an, a, a, a an ant hill, you don't really struggle to grow tall. I see life as two ways. There are some people who are born on top of mountains, and there are some people who are born on the foot of mountains. So for some, their very first step in life, they are descending. And for others, their very first step in life, they are climbing. So if you are going to compete with somebody who was born on the top of the mountain and they started off descending. And you have to first climb to the very top before you start to descend. You cannot compete with them. For the young ones amongst us, social media these days has been heightened this competition. People are having their weddings and they would have to go and borrow and spend lavishly in order to be able to flood Instagram with wedding videos and photographs. Competition can be destructive. A lot of the things we see on social media, some are even not genuine, make believe. Identify and follow your unique purpose in life. I sincerely believe that I am not here by accident and I don't think you're also here by accident. And one story in the Bible that often inspires me in this regard on living a purposeful life is a life of the story of Esther. When Mordecai told Esther to intervene for the Jews, she gave very genuine reasons and excuses why she couldn't do that. If she did and failed, she could have lost her life. But at the point, Mordecai said that, do not think that because you're in the king's palace, you alone of all the Jews, will survive. 
but who knows that you were brought into this position for this royal position for such a time as this. I'm paraphrasing what he said. For if you keep quiet, deliverance for the Jews will come from somewhere else, but you and your household would what? Perish. Esther heard these words, she was so touched. She told them to go and pray, she and her servants would pray, and on the appointed day, she would appear before the king, even if she wasn't invited to intercede for the Jews. And she said, if I perish, I perish. If you look at the circumstances under which sorry, Esther got such favor in the palace, and Mordecai telling her these words about the purpose for which she might have risen to that royal position, then it was only fitting that she take that risk. And she did take the risk, but the Jews were saved because of her. I don't know your story. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know the position you occupy. I don't know where you want to go, but I sincerely believe that wherever you find yourself, don't think that you are there just because of you. You may be in a certain position, not to become the greatest leader, but to groom the greatest leader. You might be in a certain position not to be rich, but to raise millionaires. You might be in a certain position not to become influential, but to just give hope to somebody who would have given up in life if you were not there. So if you become selfish and everything is about you, you are likely to amass wealth through fair and foul means, get to the very top but you may end up not living the purpose for which God created you. So knowing your purpose and following it would help you to manage the conflict between money and integrity. I wanted to be a bank manager till at a point, I believe journalism is a calling because I, growing up, I saw the bank manager of Ghana Commercial Bank in Kitekrachi, he had a small Opel car he was in Thai and sealed, and in that small district, I couldn't think of any more successful person. So I went to do business and uh, applied to the University of Cape Coast to do become Bachelor of Commerce. That's in 2005. I didn't get admission. I was waiting to apply the following year. And then a certain man met me one day casually and said, Man, as you write so well, why don't you go and do journalism? I said I did business and not journalism, so I couldn't become a journalist. It was the first time I heard that a business student could apply to be to study in the school of journalism. It was the first time I heard about the Ghana Institute of Journalism, and I applied. And looking back, I have no regrets. The modest impact in the life or lives of certain individuals is more rewarding than any position I could have held in my accounting profession. So for me, um, when I didn't get admission to the University of Cape Coast, I felt so distraught. But a year ago, the final year students of University of Cape Coast, the communications department, their final examination or end of term examination was on the works of a certain journalist called Manasseh. So the university that denied me admission had a student now studying my work. And I couldn't be more grateful to God for denying me that position. So I believe all of us have a purpose to achieve in life. To be able to manage conflict, the conflict between money and integrity, I think we should admit that poverty is real, but we should also admit that poverty is relative. I wrote uh, an article recently, and uh, it was about the uh, despised Bugatti and the matters arise. And I said, look, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that because somebody has a big mansion in East Legon, you are poor because you have one bedroom house in, let's say, uh, 
or Yarifa or any of the places that may not be very prime. The fact that somebody is riding in a Bugatti doesn't mean that you are poor because you are driving a Kia Picanto. The fact that somebody can afford to eat in Kempinski uh, breakfast there, eat lunch in Golden Tulip and spend a weekend in Dubai doesn't mean you are poor because of your modest lifestyle. Sometimes we bring so much pressure on ourselves just because we tend to equate poverty to what others have. We try to match it. And if we don't match up to their standard or level, we think, well, we are poor. I believe that if you acknowledge that poverty is real, also acknowledge that it is relative, you are likely to be able to be content with what you have. To manage the conflict, one of the things I think we should also look at is to live each day as if it were our last. All of us here at this uh, functional program, there is none of us who can beat our chest and say that tomorrow by this time I'll be alive. No matter how healthy you are, anything can happen and you would wake up tomorrow and your name will no longer be called, you'll be referred to as the body. It is very possible. So if today were your last day, what would we care so much about? Would you want to go about amassing wealth in a very negative way and depriving others? Or you would want to leave a legacy, you'd want to be reminded you want your name to evoke certain respect and admiration even if you are, when you are gone. Living each day as if it were your last, which is very much possible that it could actually be, helps you to set your priorities right. And setting your priorities right, and setting your priorities right, ill-gotten wealth shouldn't be something that you should want to consider when your last day is reduced into hours. Also to be able to manage this conflict, I think that you should begin to believe that when it matters most, money, money doesn't matter. When it matters most, money doesn't matter. When it matters most, is when life is departing from our mortal bodies. We one day woke up and realized that a certain very powerful man went to work as a president of Ghana. And uh, wherever he sat, you would realize that he's, uh, or when he was asleep, people had to be awake. He was heavily guarded. But by the close of the day, he was referred to as the body, not his excellency. He was in the morgue with ordinary people, including homeless people who had been knocked down by vehicles. They couldn't build his own morgue for him. If money could save him at that point, I don't think President Mills would have died. So money, as people say money, you see people on social media, whenever a rich man displays wealth, that money stops all nonsense, money solves all, solves all problems. No, sometimes when it matters most, your name can sometimes be better than your money. Make your currency, currency more valuable than a legal tender. The currency, currency of your life the importance of your life, the weight people attach to your name should be more valuable than just a legal tender, than a dollar note, no matter how many of them you have. There is a businessman in Zimbabwe, Strive Masiwa, Masiwa, and he says, integrity is better capital than money. You can accumulate it just like money and you can use it just like money, but it goes further. 
and it is enduring. So I am not here to tell you that money is not good. Far from it. Money is good. I'm not here to tell you, well, don't make money because it's vanity. Far from it. Make money if you have the ability, the skill to make money. But don't make money in a dishonest way. The money that belongs to you is something you have worked for or something somebody is giving you genuinely without any negative strings attached. Make money in such a way that you can sleep peace at night. Make money, but ensure that when you are stripped of all your resources, your name will be more valuable than your money. And when it matters most, nobody takes money away. All of us will be reduced to a memory. And it will be better for people to say, well, to this uh, boy, his father, his mother was a man of integrity. Than to say, well, his father was that rich man, but uh, this rich people, there were so many stories about how he made his money and we never got to the bottom of it. And, he died tragically and uh, see how now everything is scattered. So the conflict between money and integrity is going to be real. It is not going to end today. And all of us at a point in our lives are going to face this conflict. But the question is, which one are you prepared to make it prevail. I suggest to you that the good old name is still far better, far valuable, far honorable, and far more rewarding than wealth. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, well spoken. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. As predicted, the presentation has been intriguing, very personal and uh, what most uh, people in the call today can relate with. Thank you Manasseh for such an interesting presentation. Very impressive that you, uh, by your own initiative, even changed your, your own name. This is certainly what must and should be done in our continent, transformation and positive change and integrity, as you have already highlighted, is the core, the center of it. So as we started uh, this series this uh, evening, uh, I mentioned that this is where we have candid discussions on uh, pertinent and contemporary issues that affect our continent. We not only talk about the issues, but we also think together on some practical solutions that our countries, our continent urgently and desperately needs. So we deeply appreciate your insights and also to reconfirm, we have such a wealth of experience on, on the call to uh, this evening, uh, Salt Institute Management, and I'm sure we'll hear uh, some, of, some, some of the management uh, giving some comments or even posing some questions. For sure, leadership is a process. And in Salt Institute, this is where the process is intentionally shaped and domesticated to get transformational leaders into the continent. This is through the different uh, programs, the master's programs, as well as the Salt Institute a series like um, the guest seminar series and the public lectures that we normally hold. You have mentioned very key points, uh, Manasseh, and I would like to just uh, echo three of those. First, leadership is not about being great or occupying a great office. Everybody can be, a lead, uh, can be great because anybody can serve and without doubt, leadership is service. And the third point is integrity is, better, is a better capital than money. The fact that your name is more important than great riches. The Bible even highlights that as well. These are uh, tweetable quotes. And now I would like to go get into the questions and maybe even before po posing some of the questions that I have, I would like to invite all the participants to, after listening uh, for the past uh, almost hour to this very interesting uh, discussion and presentation, 
to busy yourselves by typing in the questions you have or any points you may have that we can discuss together on the quest for transformational leadership, managing the conflict between integrity and money. Additionally, you may feel free to raise your hand and I will give you the opportunity to further engage our guest speaker who's, who has a wealth of experience as you've heard him. And uh, now uh, Manasseh, you kept referring to leadership and service. In essence, servant leadership. In your opinion, in a scale of one to 10, and this is where my question comes, the first question, where is Africa as a continent in terms of servant leadership? So in that scale. And then, and second uh, independent question from the first one, with the measure that countries uh, like Ghana and even other countries in the continent have put in place to underpin integrity in the government, where is the rain still beating us? This is also in line with the introductory remark that you made, the fact that we as a continent appear to be so behind yet we have so much resources, including the human as well as the natural resources. So Manasseh, if you can handle these two questions and then I will come back with um, in a session of two, two questions each uh, because we have another 52 minutes or so to engage you further. So please, I welcome all the participants to feel free to type in your questions, but Manasseh, would you kindly respond to these two questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when I, or if I want to rank seven leadership in this continent from one to 10, uh, one being lowest and 10 being the highest, I'll give it about three because in the leadership that matters at a national level, you hardly find them seven. They come as lords they try as much as possible to distance themselves from the ordinary person. And they don't even want to suffer or go through what we are going through. So if the road is bad and they are put in a position to fix the road, they would want to buy certain vehicles that will make them not feel the effect of the bad roads. Mm -hmm. If the school is terrible, they would want to take their children to schools in the United States so that they would escape the effects of the bad education here. You have some of them who get pregnant and they fly to the United States to give birth in order to get citizenship for their children over there. So those deliberate attempts to distance themselves from the people they serve to distance themselves from the woes of the people uh, is very much uh, present here. And in the UK, for instance, if you look at their parliament and you see the prime minister living like an ordinary person, some district chief executives here even uh, enjoy better kinds of, uh, not let's say better, but uh, more glamorous kinds of lifestyle than some of the top people there. So what I believe is that we are here to see that servant leadership. And uh, in the few instances that we've seen it working, it's actually making some impact. And I worked in the multimedia group, for instance, and uh, the CEO, Kwesi Chum, is somebody I always speak highly of wherever I go. Kwesi Chum would come to the multimedia group, and if you didn't know him, you would think he's one of the staff members. He comes dressed like he, you won't find him showing off. Some of the people he employs even uh, show off more than him. Just very ordinary. He says the first name policy. So I can, if we see this, this one oh, share me, and this is how we relate. I have stopped working. I resigned from this institution, but from time to time, I receive a call. Oh, hold on, man. I say he doesn't need a mobile phone. Hold on, Manasi, because he wants to talk to you. I've uh, had 
from you or about you and your family for so long. I'm calling to find out how you're faring. These kinds of uh, leadership, if we have them at the national level, at the very top level, I believe we would see some impact. The person not just trying to let everybody know that they are greater than everybody, but relating at people's level, meeting them at their, uh, their, their, their level and addressing their needs. So if African leaders, and in this case, I'm putting the leaders in quotes because what we have is not truly about leadership. If we had them serving the people instead of coming to behave like Arabian kings and princesses and queens, I think we would get somewhere. Now, the reason I think you, the second question has to do about the certain measures being put in place to uh, ensure integrity in public life and the rest, but we don't seem to be seeing uh, the impact. I believe uh, it is not so much about who or what is being done. It has more to do with the integrity of the person doing it. When Obama came to Africa and addressed Ghana's parliament, he made a statement that uh, made a lot of waves across the world that Africa needed strong institutions and not strong leaders. I also believe that strong institutions are not built by just the walls or how glamorous those institutions are, but it takes strong people. And when I talk about strong people, it's not the cowards who hide behind guns, no. Strong people are men and women with integrity, men and women with values, men and women who have principles, men and women who are prepared to suffer for what they believe in, the righteousness they want to exalt. These are the strong people I think we need to build a country. So we've always had a Ghana police service. In time past, you had a, some of them doing presentation and telling us that, look, the police service cannot do or be independent and take on a politician or do what is right because if you arrest somebody, you hear a call from the politician. Then we had a certain crazy police officer called ACB, uh, uh, ACP Amubitor Awuni, who was so bold that he arrested a former Greater Accra Regional Minister who was MP at the time. The minister said, you don't know who I am. I can, he removed his cap and said, take it. If you think you can be a better police officer, and the people who were following the minister uh, or the MP at the time doing the registration disturbing or ran away. I have already spoken about the police officer who is able to challenge the chairman of the municipal security council and prevailed. And this happened because there is a leader at the top who would not signal left and turn right. So the average police officer knows today that if I misbehave, I will not be shielded, even if the politician intervenes. If I do what is right, I will have an IGP to back me. So in the past, when this uh, municipal chief executive would go there and misbehave and the police say, stop, stop, then once he stops, oh, honorable, sorry, oh, your boys are here. Oh. And they salute and then go. That era is gone just because we have leadership. So some people ask Manasa, will Ghana ever get better? We will get better if we ever have a dump party at the Jubilee House. We'll get better or we'll ever have a Daniel Yaudomelevo at the Jubilee House. They are not angels. Nobody's an angel. We all, we all have our weaknesses, but at least you should have people who, are, who stand for something, not people who preach certain virtues, get to the Jubilee House and become the polar opposite of what made them who they are. But people are prepared to suffer for righteousness. And once we get those people leading the nation, there's likely to be transformation. If the health minister 
who admitted to breaching procurement and uh, eventually leading us to sign a contract to buy the Sputnik V vaccine, a dose costing $10, who were buying through a very shady intermediary in the Dubai and were paying about twice the cost. All of this came out. The president went to his constituency, was making jokes of the issue. What motivation wouldn't any other minister or government appointee not have to misbehave? But if the whip is cracked and the minister knows that if I mess up, I'll be dealt with, the chief director and those at the ministry will also know that, well, if I also mess up, I'll be dealt with. At the end of the day, the nation will get better. So I believe that what is lacking is not so much about our institutions, the constitution and the rest, but principled leadership with integrity is what we are lacking. And once we are not able to get that, we can only keep praying that one day we get such a person. Thank you. Thank you. And the prayer is that one day is sooner rather than later. I see in the comments, uh, the participants uh, appreciate your brilliant lecture and uh, thought provoking insights. You're truly walking the talk. Bravo. And uh, keep pressing on. We cheer you on. And uh, I can confirm that you are an inspiration to the youths, not only in Ghana, but also around the continent. So before I get to the next question, I would like to indeed underline what you've mentioned that indeed we need strong systems as well as strong people in those offices because with the strong systems and then uh, we don't have people of integrity then the systems do not do well do not serve the purpose so the two are, are really a requirement for us to progress as, as a continent and as a country so i see uh, a number of hands already raised i would like just to uh, come to a second question and then i'll now give the floor to the participants please feel encouraged to type in your questions i'm monitoring those as well as raise your hands so the, um, the next question that I would like uh, you to look into is, um, you know, having won all the accolades and uh, one of the prominent ones you've mentioned is the most promising journalist of the year. You've already shared your personal experience on how the youth um, should maneuver such uh, societal expectations, especially in the wake of digital influence, which really is a, is a key, is a big thing as I see it. So in, in, uh, in a nutshell, Manasse, would you please talk more on how to escape, quote unquote, these societal expectations and more so uh, in the wake of social media pressures like Twitter, Facebook, uh, et cetera. I know you have uh, mentioned something like that, but I would like you to spend a few more minutes just to uh, embark on that. Thank you. Thank you. With the social media influence, it is uh, before it even came, uh, we tend to look at ourselves and measure our progress by also looking at where those with whom we began life are today. So if I went back to Kitekrach where I went to primary, junior high school and senior high school and realized that a lot of the people I graduated from high school with have come to build mansions. Society is going to measure me by what I have also done. So they are going to say, well, your colleagues are building mansions. What do you have? I was in Germany uh, in 2020. Then I went to visit a friend who is a German and I realized that he ever worked in Ghana here. And so the wife is a Ghanaian. And so we're having a conversation. This young woman said, uh, there they do bicycles a lot because the trains, the transportation system is so effective. So uh, there's really no need for a vehicle for a lot of people. But you can ride a bicycle, get to a train station, pack it, and then take the train to work when you come and some use it for exercise and the rest. So a bicycle is a big deal. Then the husband bought a bicycle for her 
And she took a photograph and sent it to the mother and was so happy. And the mother said, wait, Jimmy, do On fair four o'clock, I'm going to talk to my V8 mom. Walk away, bro, in a bicycle, in a trauma, on a way, And those who don't understand the tree, the mother was upset that your colleagues who are even marrying here, they are buying big vehicles for them. You have married the white man, and all that he's been able to do for you is a bicycle. And you are even not ashamed to call and then brag about the fact that your husband in Germany has bought you a bicycle. So for such a mother, the kind of expectation is likely to lead the daughter astray. For such a mother, she might not have cared if the daughter had perhaps married a gone after sugar daddy and gotten a V8 or whatever. And this is not just about this mother alone. All of us, we have either parents, relatives, or friends who think that we are not wise enough because we take certain decisions in life. So I would want the young people to know that, look, self-confidence is key. I've already spoken about uh, I've already spoken about uh, contentment, but your worth in life is not determined or should never be determined by the number of likes or comments you attract on social media. Your worth in life should not be determined by whether or not your marriage or your wedding trended. Just move according to your own uh, pace. And there are times people also just copy wrongly. When I was having my wedding, for instance, uh, Jandel was the one that did the decor for me. Jandel is one of the top people here. So if you think that, well, if Manasi got Jandel to do his decor, how much more me? The, what you may not know is that Manasi and Jandel come from the same district, Bongo, and Jandel takes Manasi as her son. So what she told Manasi was that, well, you mentioned something you can pay and I'll do it for you. And that was the arrangement. The shoe I wore for my wedding was uh, 50 CDs. And the African print I wore was less than 200 CDs. Does that mean that I had a bad marriage? No, wedding is just an event. Marriage is a lifetime activity. God blesses you and helps you to be in it. So we shouldn't just be in a hurry to also trend like others trend. No, just be yourself. And there's a trend which is very worrying. Young people borrowing, owing so much. People borrow for everything. They borrow to get cars. They borrow to do whatever. When the time comes, you will be able to afford those things without putting undue pressure on yourself. I'm praying that one day I'll also be able to buy Tia Rubber, a brand new vehicle. But as long as what I'm driving in can take me out and bring me home, I shouldn't say that because I'm a Nase and then I have made so much name, I must be able to drive a better car than any other person or those within my group because I don't know how they got this. So I will say that you may not know the full story of other people. And I've just mentioned my wedding decor that this woman virtually did it for me for free. If you consider how much you would have charged to come to a bridge to do that decor. You may have seen a garden wedding, but a brief botanical gardens, I rented a space for less than a thousand cities. So don't just look at those pictures on social media and think that, well, whatever it will take. One uh, prominent decor person told me that, look, sometimes there are people who contract them and all they say that, look, have you seen this person's wedding? I want my decor to be more than that. It doesn't matter how much it costs. That's not how life should be lived. So if we begin to stop the unnecessary competition and begin to see social media as being different from reality, 
there are certain couples who don't talk to each other in real life, but on social media, they are more than Romeo and Juliet. So a lot of the things we see, some are not true. And those that are true, they are situated within certain context, which may be far different from your context. I am number two of 11 children. So if I get uh, small money, I have possibilities back at home. There's somebody who has inherited a house, riding in cars, right from after they completed uh, uh, the university. So even if you are earning the same amount of money, your responsibilities are different. So let us just realize that look, it isn't everything that is real. It, it is not everywhere we get to. If somebody's way of defining success is that I made my first million dollars at age 35, as I sit here, I may never make a million dollars in my life, but that wouldn't mean that I failed in life. I have done stories that has uh, or have saved the country hundreds of millions of cities and dollars. I have done stories that have taken people from the village to Ashesi University from level 100 to level 400. They didn't pay a peswa. And that young man is now an engineer who is making a decent living and is helping his mother back home. If somebody's satisfaction is to ride in a Bugatti or in a luxury car, when I go to bed, I should also be satisfied. And I often say, I've written a, an article uh, detailing how my funeral should be conducted. And in that article, I said that, look, the biggest, so I think it's titled, there shouldn't be tribute at my funeral. Sometimes they come to your funeral and begin to lie. Oh, my nurse was an angel. I'm never an angel. I'm just a sinner saved by grace and so struggling. So they come to your funeral and begin to lie. He was this, he was that. And sometimes you are even ashamed. So because I cannot get up and then tell them you are lying, I say, my funeral, I don't want a tribute. The only tribute I would want is that at that funeral, there should be somebody who may not, quote unquote, prominent enough to read my tribute, but would turn to another person and say, but for this person who's been buried, who is being buried today, I wouldn't have been here in life. That is the biggest tribute I would ever want from uh, people. So set your priorities. Let people enjoy. If you have it, enjoy. But the fact that you haven't made $100,000 in your 50s or 60s doesn't mean you have failed. That's not what life is all about. Thank you. Thank you so much. You answered it uh, beyond uh, indeed. And what I hear is knowing your assignment and leaving your assignment and uh, doing it very diligently. Thank you for, for the response. Now I'll give the chance uh, for the participants to um, pose their questions. And I um, earlier saw a hand from Osman Idrisu. If you would kindly unmute yourself and, and pose your question. And then we have Herbert uh, coming after with your question. So Osman, you now have the floor. So as I do not see um, Osman's hand once again, so I would uh, pass uh, over to Herbert, but Osman, in case you still have your questions, don't hesitate to have your hand back and then I will give you the floor. Herbert, please, I see you have two questions. Go ahead and post those uh, right now. Um, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, uh, for the opportunity and thank you, uh, sir, for uh, the thought provoking presentation uh, that we have received. Uh, as the presentation was ongoing, two questions uh, came to my mind. One of them is that uh, in the African continent, we find ourselves in a situation where it's as though we've been, and I'm talking with regards to leadership, it's as though the leadership we have uh, has been uh, built on the foundation of uh, corruption, on the foundation 
uh, of their quest for uh, wealth. And uh, the serious part of this matter is that this uh, thing has trickled down to the younger generation uh, of today. And it's very amazing how uh, the youth seem to be caught uh, in this kind of uh, situation where the drive uh, for quick uh, wealth, the drive for money, and so on seems to be the order of the day. My question is how do we break uh, this kind of uh, cycle uh, with regards to the subject matter of managing the conflict between money and uh, integrity in our society. I'm asking this question because it looks as if that this issue of lack of integrity has persisted uh, over the years in many of our uh, nations in Africa. My second question uh, is that with the issue of corruption uh, being a big, a big canker in our nations and looking at the fact that uh, our systems, our institutions seems to be challenged as far as the fight of uh, this menace is concerned. I'm beginning to see that it will take us a long time to really deal uh, with the root of the problem and to tackle this challenge uh, as, uh, as far as the issue of restoring integrity back to our uh, leadership institutions is concerned. What is your take uh, on this assertion? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herbert, for the questions. The two are very much related. And I was a student leader. I, 2009, tenor about, I was a veteran committee chairman for the National Union of Ghana Students. There was a Congress in Kumasi, and after that Congress, I lost interest and respect for student politics or student leadership, as they call it. I realized that that kind of uh, politics was more acrimonious than the national politics. The propaganda and the mad slinging there is worse than what happens at the national level. And to know that these young ones use those uh, fields as preparatory grounds for national politics should give anybody who cares about the country a lot of headache. But that is the reality. I think also that because uh, our democracy, and this happens for most parts of the continent, has become a transactional one give and take people are buying power so you can have a very noble person who wants to go to parliament in that constituency and another person comes with a bag full of cash perhaps a criminal somebody without any morality somebody they wouldn't even want to be associated with their family but once they see the cash they turn their backs against the person with nobility, integrity, and all the values that one would want in leadership. So it's such a big problem. The question is, how do we deal with it? It is going to be really, really tough. Uh, you speak to the politicians and they themselves are becoming very worried that you would have to make money to stay in office. There are some seats in the last election that you know that either MPP or NDC candidates somewhere could not have won a particular seat, but with money, they did. And the people who voted for them never cared to know where the money is coming from. So I think one of the reasons, one of the, the solutions which may not yield the needed impact as early as we want it to go back to the roots. We should begin to emphasize the value system. It should start from homes. 
it is good that uh, Salt Institute is finding issues of this nature very necessary. I know investors like Ashesi has started something they call the Anna Code, that certain students can even write examination without invigilation, and they are trusted not to cheat. If we begin to teach these values to our children and leave these values for them to see, a time will come when we'll be able to build a critical mass to lead a revolution of integrity, honest and principled leadership. And once that happens, we should be able to make some headway. The current situation we have is giving politics of power to the highest payer. And if we continue this, we are going to crash because when that person makes the money, sorry, invest, they will have to recoup, recoup it. And never buy this lie that, oh, as soon as he had his money before they got into politics, no. Some of them that we claim or we are told had their money before they got into politics, still more than those who had nothing. And they still threw very dubious contracts from the ministries, departments, and agencies. So a contract that is supposed to cost uh, uh, 1 million cities will end up costing 63 million cities. And this example I'm giving is actually a fact. There was a contract to procure waste beans and bean liners. So the bean liners, I investigated this and I can uh, attest to it. I went to the company. It was one of these Zoom Lion companies. Some of you may have realized I've done a lot of stories about this company. They were supposed to supply 900,000 pieces of bean liners. So I went to that same company to take invoice in order to compare how much they were supplying to the general public and how much they were supplying to the state. So I needed 500 pieces, but the government was buying 900,000 pieces. So the economies of large scale should set in and then the government's one should have been cheaper than what I was buying. So when I went there, I asked of a piece. So they even did a calculation, a piece of bean liner, this rubber they used to cover waste beans so that it doesn't stick. And guess how much they were selling to the general public? A piece was being sold at 98 pesos, less than one CD. So the 900,000 pieces, even if we increased it to nine, sorry, one CD a piece, then that product would have been going for 900,000 Ghana cities. But guess how much they were selling each piece of that rubber, disposable rubber to the government of Ghana. They were selling it for 67 Ghana cities. So something that should have cost the Republic of Ghana less than 1 million cities was being sold over 60 million cities. Do you think the minister who signed this contract was an idiot? No. Sometimes some people have invested in this politics and they want to recoup their money. So as we build the young people and uh, try to teach them to grow with integrity, I think we should also begin to educate people to know about the cost of corruption to their lives. That when you pay that politician, when that politician pays you for your vote, he's not going to America to recoup that investment. That investment will be recouped here in Ghana. And that is going to hurt us. So education, living by example, and trying as much as possible to make uh, this a big issue in the educational institutions right to the university level will help us. Uh, the Kanka is big, as you said, the second question, and you think it will take us a long time to deal or to get to the root of the problem. And I think, uh, the second question is very much related to the first one, which concentrated on the youth. And I think also that if we want to make even the long-term impact, then we should start targeting the young people. It is said that if you want to starve the river, you cripple its source. 
So let's start crippling such a bad behavior from the very beginning. And let the young people also know that there is honor in honest job. Uh, the likes of Despite and the East Legon Executive Clubs, they've made money. Let's celebrate them. Let's also celebrate that young or that uh, old man who taught people at the Labawaleshi cluster of schools. And out of this man's tutelage, we have professors, engineers, doctors, and very noble people across the world. This man may be dying in a rented single room apartment, but let's also point to that man and say, no, he is not a failure because he's not been able to get to the likes of the East Legon Executive Club. He has succeeded in other very enormous ways. And once we do that, we are likely to shape their thinking and their mind because now everything is about people have made money. Let's celebrate them. I'm not against that, but there are people who have also made certain impacts in our lives and in the lives of people that money cannot buy. So when we begin to point people to some of these directions, then they will begin to realize that, well, money is not only or the only directional sign to success in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Manasse, for such an extensive response. And when I hear the uh, exaggerated pricing in procurement in the government, I'm reminded of some scandals we also had in Kenya. I'm, I'm from Kenya. So it's something that I also reminded. And it's sad to, to hear such cases. But uh, thank you for responding and being very exhaustive in, in your answer. I see um, a number of hands. Thank you. I, I'll give uh, the floor uh, first to our very own um, Dr. Mauli Kofi, who has posed the question in the chat. But uh, um, Dr. Kofi, you have the floor. Uh, if you can kindly unmute yourself and, and pose your question. Uh, thank you very much, um, Catherine. Uh, you are doing a brilliant job. Uh, I'm so inspired by your very excellent hosting and um, moderation. I'm equally inspired, fascinated by the brilliant presentation of our good friend Manasseh, uh, uh, an old time follower on all the fronts of your, uh, of your career and your accomplishments. And I, I want to say that um, you are a very highly accomplished individual, uh, and I'm glad that you are adding to the mission and vision of SORT Institute, which essentially is to prepare the next generation of leaders. This kind of lecture actually addresses our mission directly, and I'm so glad to have you speak in such a very passionate and profound manner. My question is about how can we, um, or why are we not getting leaders that want to accumulate the integrity capital, which as you rightly pointed out, endures far more than financial capital? My aim in this question is how we can inspire the new generation to start to accumulate that integrity capital. Sometimes I call it reputation capital, but I like your terminology, integrity capital. How can we inspire them to start accumulating them that now? Because as you rightly said, it endures far more. So if they accumulate that now, they will get okay, to turn on the light. They will be able to spend that capital and be as successful as people like your good selves. How do we ensure that? Thank you. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, apart from what I mentioned in my subsequent response to the previous question, and thank you so much for your kind words. I very much appreciate it. Apart from that, we should also begin to teach at all levels the reward for integrity. It isn't only doom and gloom if you want to serve with integrity. I say to the glory of God that since I started my investigative journalism career, I never took 
a CD, a peso or a dollar from somebody to look away from wrongdoing. That doesn't mean I'm poor. This has given me the opportunity to go to a number of countries. I was in Kenya for transfer, uh, transparency, uh, financial transparency conflict, uh, sorry, seminar. As soon as I spoke, the second organizer said they were doing another one in Indonesia. They liked how I spoke, so they invited me to Indonesia. I have been to the United States Department of State's uh, uh, International Visa Leadership Program. I've had a number of exposures. I have not applied for a job since I left school. I've rather rejected job office. So I say to the glory of God that my life as a journalist has generally been uh, the, 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 the dangers and other things are there. But if you look at the other side, I don't think I'm poor because from a home that I hardly found where my next meal was coming from to where I have a decent place to live, I can feed myself and my family. I don't think I'm poor. So we should also begin to point out these things to people that look. Once you begin to live this way, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to suffer for the rest of your life. There are certain benefits. There are certain places that you go that people and their monies couldn't go. There was this Millennium Excellence Award at the Tomb Force Palace. I was called. And as protocol, when you step forward, you like bow to the president, the Otunfo. My name was called Otunfo, the president, and all the people who mattered in this country were all clapping for me. Money cannot buy this. I find it so honorable that Salt Institute, you want to talk about integrity, and I find favor I to be addressing you. Some of you, places you've gone, I've never been there. So if I have the opportunity to be interacting with you, I don't take it lightly. I see it as a great reward. There are people who have all the money in this world, but you not invite them for this seminar. So that is a reward that people should begin to know that look. In life, reward and satisfaction can be derived from a whole lot of places the kind of respect your name evokes in the memory of people, in the minds of people, is as important as the amount of money you have. People say that integrity in uh, For the young people, I'll say that, look, the good thing is that when you build it over the years, this integrity capital, you may not be that uh, necessarily rich, but you, you, you will not lack. There are certain things I do and I'm paid, I go to take some jobs and I get paid consultancies just because of what I've built over the years. I was returning from, uh, I went to Nyangpala University of uh, the UDS to do something, I was coming back. So I put on Facebook that well. Tamale, if you are around, you can meet me for an autographed copy of my book. And I have three books, Letters to My Future Wife, Voice of Conscience, and then the, the fourth John. At the time, I hadn't published the fourth John. So it was Letters to My Future Wife and then Voice of Conscience. And a certain man I hadn't met before in my life met me on my way to the airport and said, how much was the copy? And I said, a copy was uh, 50 CDs. So the two would cost 100 CDs. This man handed a thousand CDs to me. And what he said was, look, you have no idea how some of us admire. We think you are fighting this fight for us and our future generations. So this is just to tell you how appreciative I am of your work. This may not be a, a, a million dollar, but the worst and the heart that goes with it is something you should appreciate. So I think uh, going forward, one of the other things we should be highlighting, the good examples, the churches, 
if you are inviting somebody, you have harvest and inviting people, who do you allow to sit uh, in the front pews? Is it the rich people who pay their tithes in bags or people with good character who can inspire the young people? So I believe we should begin to highlight persons with integrity as role models in society. And in addition to the others I talked about earlier, we may be making some modest gains. Otherwise, we will be doomed forever. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, with every answer you give, there's quite a lot uh, of weight that comes with it. Thank you for, for the response. And thank you, Dr. Kofi, um, for, for your kind comments. Uh, indeed, I'm keenly following uh, in your footsteps. And this is what is truly appreciated in Salt Institute, where we preach water and drink water, basically walking the talk. There are mentors in Salt Institute, not only from the faculty, but from guest speakers like tonight, we have Manasseh. So it's truly an asset. And um, this is exactly what is required uh, urgently for, for the continent. So I would, uh, in the interest of time, uh, just allow the hands that have been raised uh, to, to take the floor. Please make your questions uh, brief, and then we can at least have the opportunity to hear the comments from Manasseh. Um, so for now, I will um, kindly request uh, Elzabad to please unmute yourself and, and post your question. And then this will be followed uh, by Osman uh, immediately um, after. So Elzabad, please, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, good, after, good evening, uh, dear Manasse and all the participants. I'm calling for Pretoria. I really enjoy this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've got two questions. The first one is, somebody says, behind every behavior, there is a belief system. According to your observation, how does the prosperity gospel affect integrity in Africa? That's the first one. The second one is closely related to the first one. Uh, someone says that the moral state, show me the moral state of a, a nation, and I will show you the moral state of the church. What do you think about it? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words and for the question. I agree to some extent that uh, the prosperity gospel is not helping because some preach it out of context. In the Bible, we know people were rewarded for being honest and faithful to God. The lives of Abraham were rewarded for their faithfulness. So certain wealth uh, goes with some, the exhibition of certain good character that God found worth rewarding. These days, what they take out, and then most preachers do that, they take out the process and they project the end. So you find a thief who is being projected in church as an example of success. And if you pay your tithe well, if you are honest with your tithe, God will bless you like this man. What you do is that you disintegrate whatever or beliefs that somebody may have held all these years and make them believe that once they are able to make it, irrespective of how they made it, you would go even beyond celebrating their wealth to now ascribe certain statuses on them which they don't even deserve, confer righteousness that they are hundreds of miles away from on them. So, to that extent, I believe that the prosperity gospel as we have it in Africa here doesn't uh, work. I also believe that uh, the moral state of the nation to some extent can be equated 
with the moral state of the church. So if the church, which is supposed to be the citadel of righteousness, becomes a den of criminality, they don't expect morality in a brothel. But I have also grown to realize that there are certain countries that don't uh, have strong affection for religion. You go there and things appear to be working so well. I lost my iPad in Germany at a drinking spot <clears throat> near the Cologne Cathedral. We're there with colleagues and I don't smoke, I don't drink. So there I always got up. And whilst I was leaving, I didn't go back to pick my iPad from the table. So later we called, we were in Guma's back. So we called and then the, the restaurant said, one of the people who was working there saw it and brought it. So I was driven then to take it the following day. Then when we were coming back, the, the German who drove me, they said, well, if this was in your country, would you have found it? And I had to be honest, the chances that I would have found this iPad, even in the church, was going to be difficult in Ghana. So that reality is there. But there's also another reality that I want to emphasize, that we should emphasize godliness above religion. I believe that here we are so religious, but very ungodly. So when you go to a country that is godly, but not religious, you still find them progressing more than where religion is emphasized. The other issue is also about systems. I don't believe that uh, the church or the country Ghana is not governed by the Bible. It's a secular state. The constitution is what is used. And there is no country in the world that has developed and built strong systems just by virtue of how obedient people are to moral suasion. My first trip outside Ghana was in South Africa and I was in Santon. I won an award and I was sponsored. So I was in Santon. Then I had to do internship with the Star newspaper, which was in the central business district of Johannesburg. And so one Sunday morning, I was asked to relocate to a hotel. I was in the Ashanti Hotel in Johannesburg. The driver who was bringing me there uh, from Santin to Johannesburg Sunday morning at a point slowed down. So I asked why he had to slow down all of a sudden. He said, oh, on this stretch, there are speed cameras. And so if you went beyond the accepted speed limit, they would bring him a ticket. And because he was driving a, a, a rented, sorry, he was driving for a car rental company, he could lose his job if he was careless. So that made me realize that that driver is not necessarily more obedient or righteous than the driver from uh, Kaneshi to Kaswa in Ghana who behaves as if they are on a suicide mission. When there are systems to hold people responsible for their actions, the likelihood that they are going to be obedient is very high. So the church has its own problems, but I also believe that even in countries that they don't believe in Christianity, majority of them don't go to church and no affiliation to any other religion, certain systems or certain things work because if you misbehave, the law will deal with you irrespective of who you are. But if you, I, I said somewhere that if, laws are enforced in hell and laws are not enforced in heaven. Hell will be more orderly than hell. And have, sorry, hell will be more orderly than heaven and heaven will be more chaotic than hell. So I believe that the churches should do their part, but I also believe that systems must work. If you break traffic rule, and you know the consequences are that you can lose your license at, 
as happens in other countries, you are likely to be more careful. But if you break it and you know that oh, the worst you can do is to part way with uh, 10 cities and the police officer say, oh, you go. The likelihood that you do that or you repeat that is very high. So yes, the morality of the church should be questioned, but we should preach more of godliness than religious religiosity and we should enforce our laws and ensure that systems work because the same Ghanaians who live here and go to other countries are not able to do the things they do here because they know that you can do that and get away with it in another country thank you thank you for that and um uh, Osman, would you kindly just, I don't want to say more because of, of time. Uh, Osman, just kindly unmute yourself, make your question brief. And then, uh, already may I request the participants to allow uh, an extra 10 minutes, maximum 15, just to wind this uh, interesting discussion. Thank you for your yeah. patience. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good evening to you. Uh, good evening, uh, Manasseh. I, I am very grateful for the opportunity given to interact with my uh, very good friend and uh, brother. Manasse. I think uh, I will try to make my question as brief as uh, possible. I can uh, confirm to Manasse's presentation where he says he have applied to University of Cape Coast and wasn't able to get admission that particular year, but later the whole communication department has to set examination questions around his name. And today the students are still eulogizing him and praising him for the good work that he has done. Some are even craving to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with him anytime soon. But my question now is uh, straightforward. Uh, Manasse, how are you always able to swim against the tide? I remember I, I have called you on two occasions to draw your attention to some media publications either documentaries or commentaries that were going against you. Sometimes it was always Manasseh against the entire nation. Yet you are always sometimes to maintain a very positive balance. Is, it, uh, is there something divine or spiritual about it? Or is it just a matter of uh, training? Or how are you able to balance that? Because sometimes it beats my imagination. The whole nation seems to be against you and yet you maintain your firm focus and you are able to uh, sail through. You did a lot of stories that's quote and unquote, I can describe as controversial. You receive a lot of bashing across the country. You know, any other person who is not so strong can break down and even leave the profession. How are you able to maintain the balance of that integrity or build on the integrity capital, if I can borrow your word again? Thank you very much. Thank you. I must say it hasn't been easy. It is a sacrifice. And uh, yeah, people think Manas is fearless. That isn't true. I often say that I'm not suicidal. I would want to live as long as God wants me to live. So I am not that fearless, but it is about um, deciding to take a risk and taking that risk in the general interest of the people. I come from a very poor background. So when I see people who are being cheated, I feel it for them and what their children are likely to go through. Some of the things I feel the pain and the need for justice, that drives me. I must also say that the grace of God has been very sufficient for my life. Uh, I'm human. I don't have a thick skin. My skin is just like any other person. But it is just a decision to endure what others would not endure for the very reasons you are citing. Because sometimes you do something. For instance, this story I did about the, the, the waste bin that was awarded to the Zoom line in this group of companies. It resulted in the cancellation of a $74 million contract. At the time, the convention was around 330 million Ghana cities. The nation saved this amount of money. No Peswa came to Manasseh. 
but I had a lot of backlash. And the Ghana Journalists Association released a press statement to condemn me over that work. But there was absolutely nothing wrong with the work. They couldn't say that you breached this code or you breached that code. But everybody was loud against Manasi. So if your own uh, media people are against you, and sometimes the very people you are fighting for, there are some young people who don't have jobs, but they will sit on social media and then insult you. If I wanted to make money, I'll shut up and then uh, live a better life. So sometimes it can really be difficult, but uh, as a Christian, I believe my work as a journalist has been a calling. And I also believe that if God calls you and you try as much as possible to do it with a clean heart and a clean conscience, he will give you the strength to endure and the security you would need to continue to live and do your work. So I count every single day of my life as a gift of God. And the good thing is that I go to bed knowing that I've done the work with the best of my ability. No malice. I don't go to take something to destroy another person. So once my conscience is clean, it helps to overcome all the attacks that sometimes are directed at me. But I can say it hasn't been easy. And when you have family who are so worried, calling you, be careful, this and that, sometimes it can really get to you. But I believe God has been faithful. I like that. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, uh, Manasse. And I would like to say amen. When God calls you, he indeed equips you. Uh, very encouraging to, to hear what you're doing. And finally, and very importantly, uh, we have a comment uh, from our very own Dr. Fatima Alabo. Um, so Dr. Fatima, would you kindly unmute yourself and now you, you have the floor. You see, it's quite interesting of a discussion and short time it is, I must admit. Dr. Fatima, please, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Mr. Manasse. I really enjoyed uh, the discussion. I said from the beginning to, to now. And uh, what really impressed me is as young as you are, with the family, 11, 10 brothers, maybe they are younger, they are looking up, up to you than a family of your own. And still you could resist the, the, the pressure of uh, losing your integrity. Um, and I want uh, the student of Salt Institute to just look at you in the video, look at your, uh, uh, how healthy you look, how, uh, everything that a person can wish for, we can see it on the screen. So he could be having a, a, a million dollar in the bank or hundred Ghana CD, and uh, you will not make the difference because he is speaking the integrity from his heart. And that's what God requires of us. Uh, I just want to, just for the student to understand that uh, social media, the influence of it, will not take you to, uh, uh, to, to the place where God wants you to be. You have to take models, role models like Manasseh. You have them in the Bible. And uh, one of the negative one I say, and I always think that Africa suffers from uh, what we are suffering from. I'm from uh, originally from Morocco. So I'm, uh, I'm as African as you are. So we, uh, we suffer because the foundations are wrong. The Bible say what the righteous can do if the foundations are wrong, are faulty. Our foundations are faulty. The, we got the independence, the, the colonial power never left. And that's where the corruption of our leaders started. When you don't uh, uh, take co corruption, they will kill you. We have seen it from Africa, those his, uh, history students, you will hear how the uh, Jorn Krumah, uh, first of all, Aaron Krumah was uh, assassinated. So you see that um, either you be the one that will stand like Manasseh, you will be like Rehoboam in uh, 1 King 12, 7, 
when the people, when he was uh, elected the king, the people came to him and asked him, please, your father was very hard on us. Please let the yoke be um, like lighter. Okay, he called the elders and said, what I should do? He said, the elders, listen to what he said. Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke you put on us and we will serve you. He is the king then he, we will serve you if you do that. And Rehoboam and Sarah go away three days and come back. So he went, I'm going faster. So Rehoboam, the king went and consulted the elders, the old people. The old people told him, the older people told him, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will, all be, they will always be your servants. Now, the situation in our continent, the majority of African countries have turned down. Like um, Mr. Manasseh said, when you, you struggle to get the power through corruption, through everything, buying chairs, buying uh, <laughs> seats, buying anything, you go to power, then people who voted for you now become your servants. Not because you are serving them, but because you have uh, the foundation on which you are sitting are wrong. So I think that uh, as a SALT Institute, the student should look deep into the, the, the heart. And uh, religion has never helped nobody. But the relationship with God, the true relationship with God and with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in that manner where you fear God, that's what will bring the true leadership. Once you fear God, you see him always on your head. He's sitting there, you sit with him in the chair, you drive with him, you eat with him. So you cannot take corruption when God is there. So you cannot talk to somebody anyhow when between you, Christ is seated. So what I had today make me have more hope. I always follow Manasseh on the news, what he's saying. But today, seeing his story from the deepest of his heart, I will be just happy to, to have this young man uh, giving us from time to time a lecture to the young people instead of them going to social media, wasting precious time comparing the, all the things. God bless you, Manasseh. I'm so proud of you, my son. I'm proud of you. God bless you. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. God bless you for the kind words of encouragement. Thank you so much, uh, Manasseh. You've touched not only Ghana, but uh, North, South, East, and West of, of Africa and beyond. I believe there are people connecting from the, uh, out of the continent. So it has been very insightful. And for that, I, would, I see some questions still coming up. So please, for the participants, in case you have questions, direct those to the SALT Institute. And uh, Manasseh, allow us to both of you uh, a little more with some questions from the students and hear your opinion on this very important topic. Uh, because I believe, and as you can see, the discussion cannot stop, it cannot end. It is. It will continue. And so um, kindly, once again, the participants, feel free to pose your questions directly to the SALT Institute and um, we will uh, make an effort to make sure that um, we get the opinion or the comments from uh, Manasseh. And um, now, finally, just to wind this up, um, I would like to uh, invite one of the students, Dora, uh, to join uh, Hedwig, Estelle, Obed, and all the participants who have shared uh, their uh, congratulations and uh, actually comments of appreciation in the chat uh, to just give a vote of thanks for uh, the session that we've had together. So please, Dora, would you kindly un unmute yourself and give the vote of thanks? And then afterwards, let's have Obed to close us with a word of prayer. Dora, you uh, have thank Thank you, Catherine. Uh, distinguished guest speaker, my name is Dora Fiagbenu, a student in international relation and diplomacy at the SALT Institute, Cohort 3. I am privileged to take the floor on the behalf of the board of SALT Institute, on behalf of the entire family, entire faculty of SALT Institute, on behalf of the student of SOT Institute and on behalf of the entire family of SOT Institute to propose to you, Mr. Azuri, 
Manasse, a vote of thanks. You spared time out of your busy schedule to grace today's guest seminar with your most appreciated contribution. This evening, we had an opportunity to hear you, Mr. Manasse, to hear your thoughts <laughs> on the topic, the quest for transformational leadership, managing the conflict between integrity and money. And this will surely serve us, serve as an encouragement to all of us in our day in, day out. Indeed, Mr. Manasse, your life is a life testimony of the topic under discussion. Your delivery has enlightened and shown us a new path in leadership and especially money management in leadership. Mr. Manase Azuri Awuni, may the almighty God bless and replenish you for blessing us with this profound and insightful nuggets on leadership. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Catherine. Yes, thank you so much, Dora, for that. And now uh, I, can, I don't want to add any more. I just want to, as to close with a word of prayer, but to just say thank you once again, Manasse, And thank you to all of you who have patiently extended for an extra 20 minutes. I promised 15, but we've extended even beyond. Thank you so much. So Obed, kindly, would you uh, close us with a word of prayer? Sorry, Obed, we cannot hear you, or at least I cannot hear you in case you are already praying. Can, can anybody hear Obed or it's only me? Um, Catherine, we cannot hear you, so uh, you may okay. just close up the prayer, please. Thank you, Michael, for unmuting yourself. Please go ahead and close us with a word of prayer. Oh. <laughs> I was asking you to do so. All right, let me pray. Lord, we are grateful. Thank you for such a very thought-provoking um, seminar. And uh, we're very grateful for Manasseh's life. We pray a special blessing of protection over him as you use him to show the light, Lord, um, of your kingdom in our nation and across the world. We ask that you preserve the likes of him. You, you have commanded us that our light should shine before me that they will see our deeds and glorify you in heaven. So we pray that many of such remnants will be raised in our family, in our, in our nation, in our society, across the continent, that we'll have people who blaze the torch of integrity and they will not compromise on, on their stance for the truth. We ask that you will reward his sincerity and honesty. He's human and many temptations may come his way. We pray that you help him to, to overcome these. And we pray that, Lord, the values of integrity, which he, he has so clearly demonstrated of the, over the last couple of years, Jesus, you will place this in our students, that um, each and every one of them, Lord, will become salt to their generation as they leave the Institute. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It was double yeah. prayer and amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Until next time, remain blessed and uh, shalom. Thank shalom. you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine.